Hello and welcome to another episode of Twimmel Talk, the podcast where I interview interesting people doing interesting things in machine learning and artificial intelligence. I'm your host, Sam Charrington. Once again, let's start the show by sending some love out to you, the listeners, for your continued support over the last few weeks and months. This community continues to amaze us, continues to grow and to engage with us, which we love to see. We've said it before, but please don't hesitate to reach out to us with any questions, comments, guest or topic requests, or just a friendly hello via any of our various channels. You can reach us on our Facebook page or Twitter at Twimmel AI. You can reach me directly at Sam Charrington on Twitter, or you can email us at team at twimmelai.com. Speaking of community, please take note. The next Twimmel online meetup is coming up soon. On Tuesday, November 14th at 3 p.m. Pacific time, we'll be joined by Kevin T, who will be presenting his paper, Active Preference Learning for Personalized Portfolio Construction. If you've already registered for the meetup, you should have received an invitation with all the details. If you still need to sign up, just head on over to twimmelai.com meetup to do so. We hope to see you there. Now, as you may know, A few weeks ago, we spent some time in New York City, hosted by our friends at NYU Future Labs. About six months ago, we covered their inaugural AI Summit, an event they hosted to showcase the startups in the first batch of their AI Nexus Lab Accelerator program, as well as the impressive AI talent in the New York City ecosystem. Well, this time we had the pleasure of interviewing the four startups from the second AI Nexus Lab batch, Mount Cleverest, Byte AI, Second Mind, and Bowtie Labs. We also interviewed some of the great speakers from the event, and we're presenting a couple of those interviews to you this week. If you missed any of the shows in the series, visit twimmelai.com slash AINexusLab2 to get caught up. My guest this time is Dennis Mortensen, founder and CEO of X.AI, a company whose AI-based personal assistant, Amy, helps users with scheduling meetings. I caught up with Dennis backstage at the Future Labs event a few weeks ago, right before he went on stage to talk about investing in AI from the startup point of view. Dennis shares some great insight into building an AI-first company, not to mention his vision for the future of scheduling, something no one actually enjoys doing, and his thoughts on the future of human-AI interaction. This was a really fun interview, which I'm sure you'll enjoy. A quick warning, though. This might not be the show to listen to in the car with the kiddos, as this episode does contain a few expletives. And now, on to the show. All right, everyone, I'm here at the NYU Skirbel Center where the Future Labs group is having their AI summit. And I've got the pleasure of being backstage with Dennis Mortensen, the founder and CEO of X.AI. Dennis, welcome to the podcast. Thanks so much for having me. It's great to have you on the show. Why don't we get started by having you tell us a little bit about your background and what the company's up to? Sure. Background. So that's the four hour version, right? Yeah, exactly. Exactly. <laughs> How do you find your way into AI? So we've, sadly, because we are getting older, been at it for <laughs> about 23 years. And this wow. is our fifth venture. And they've all had really a backdrop in data. And I think we've been able to kind of massage data from the mid-90s all the way up to this point for where if you really want to massage data in the year 2017, AI is probably the, the right moniker to apply to that. So in our prior venture, we did predictive analytics for media, trying to predict which stories to carry where, say, on the homepage of CNN and for how long, and when you kill it, what other story do we put in its place? And before that, we did a enterprise web analytics company. So go to Four Seasons. How do you make sure they sell as many rooms as possible? And Mm -hmm. you try to analyze that data. So certainly just a lifetime around data. And we're very fond of that. And you, you're saying we, so this is a team of people that have kind of stuck together across these five companies or so? So we've certainly carried over team members from one venture to the next. And there's certainly some comfort in knowing that when I'm up here <laughs> with you, 
the house is not at fire at <laughs> home, right? Because <laughs> hey, I've talked to these guys for the last ten years at yeah. least. Yeah. Yeah. And for this particular venture, X.AI, it's not so much that we're an AI company. I think we are, but it's more that we've latched on to this. I think very obvious pain of setting up meetings. So it's not that we kind of invented that pain. I think both you and I figured out exactly two hours out of college that if you go to work, you set up meetings. And then right. when you set up meetings, you're not going to get a personal assistant. It's you. And yeah. you, you're going to fucking hate it. And then you do it for 20 <laughs> years straight. And that just doesn't ring true to me as in, do I do that task for the next 20 years? So I think that was perhaps the catalyst to say, hey, there might be this opening for where some intelligent agent can come along and just remove this one particular chore. Mm-hmm. And we then spent the last four years trying to engineer that intelligent agent, Amy at X.AI, so mm-hmm. that when you email me saying, hey, Dennis, I'm downtown. You've got time to meet up for a Diet Coke. I can reply back and say, yeah, I'm up for that. I have CC'd in Amy, and she can help put something on my calendar. Mm-hmm. It is now her job to remove me from the conversation, reach out to you, have this very human-like negotiation, really, mm-hmm. drive it towards conclusion, and upon conclusion, send us an invite. And it's not that you haven't seen that before. Mm-hmm. You can buy it today if you want to. It just costs you $60,000 a year, and it's called Tom. It's going to come <laughs> to your office on Monday. <laughs> but if you want to pay $17 instead, you should hire AV. Yeah, nice, nice. And you've been at it for four years. Can people sign up for it publicly? For a while, it was like invite only or something along those lines, right? Very much so. So we spent perhaps short of the first three years doing core R&D. But this is one of those products for where if there's no pre-existing data set, you're going to have that chicken and egg challenge, right? For where I need the product out there to collect some data, but I can't have the product out there because I don't have any data. So we had this (laughs) suddenly very early, early, early beta that we ran with for years that became more and more robust. Mm -hmm. And the whole thing was based on a free wait list and we were so fortunate that people immediately kind of recognized the pain and signed up for it. So we had a very long wait list and that's always nice. But early this year, we commercialized that R&D and put it to market and now been in market for short of three quarters Mm -hmm. and are just about to kind of tune our product tiers and pricing just ever so slightly, Mm -hmm. but certainly off to the races. Okay. Trying to pay back our investors. <laughs> nice, very nice. You know, one of the the dirty secrets, if you will, of AI is that, you know, at least people outside of the industry think it's just the computers doing the work. I'm imagining there's a significant human in the loop component to what you're doing. Can you tell me, you know, how much of a role, a role that plays? Sure. I think there's a difference between what you're trying to achieve. And there's nothing wrong with a human in a loop. And there's not even anything wrong with a human in a loop forever. That's called automation or augmenting the human so they can do a job slightly faster, slightly more accurate, and so on and so forth. But I think you need to decide what you want to be. Do I want to be a, if you're in the self-driving car space, a BMW with slightly better lane control? Or do I want to be Waymo with a fully autonomous vehicle in place, perhaps in a decade from now? But I don't think you can work on both at the same time, though. Because they're somewhat in conflict. And we set out to create the fully autonomous agent from day one or die trying. My investors fucking hate it when I say that out loud. <laughs> I said, there is no plan B here. And I think the difference is between one of you having a fallback for where there's something here which you didn't understand or didn't predict at a level of accuracy for where you're willing to move forward in a fully autonomous way. So you now send it back to a human who needs to kind of resolve that. Or you have not a fallback, but a willingness to make errors and simply just label the data and then upon those errors, figure out how can I make that prediction slightly more accurate tomorrow. Mm -hmm. So we're not a self-driving car. That means self-driving cars probably don't have much room for errors. Perhaps some versions of an error, which is that you stop or go to the side or anything that rhymes with that. All you're going to do is mess up my lunch tomorrow. Yeah. (laughs) <laughs> exactly. And I might even churn you as a customer, and I would hate for that to kind of happen, but yeah. I'm allowed to make mistakes here. Mm-hmm. So we've always hunted the idea of the fully autonomous agent. And that means of that 150 people we have in place for the team right now, mm-hmm. about 100 
to answer your question, so I'm not trying to yeah. avoid it. About 100 of that 150 does nothing but label data. But I think there's a distinction here between... But they're not labeling exceptions in the loop of the customer query. It's something that happens later, and Amy does what she can to figure out... It's certainly happening in real time as well, and it's happening as double annotation, and it's happening with golden data sets where they label things that aren't even part of a real customer query. Okay. But all of this for this purpose of being able to come out tomorrow with a slightly more accurate set of predictions. Sure, sure. And... That's going to be in going from zero data to millions of emails annotated over the last three years. Mm-hmm. And that becomes that corpus for where we can wake up one day and essentially have this all-margin type of software, which yeah. we can then be in market with. Yeah. So what's the... I mean, if you do have two-thirds of your team doing annotation and some of that is real-time, just like at a company that might describe that as human in the loop, what are the key distinctions between you know, building a company kind of with the idea that you're going to do that and building a company that you know, does that but abhors every minute of it? I think certainly the difference is that if you have kind of this split setting where you have a human in the loop, mm-hmm. the human then many times is tasked to make a perfect outcome, whatever the implication might be on your data set. Just make the perfect outcome. As in, right now, just swing the car to the left. I don't really care what that means to our data sets. Just swing the car to the left. Mm -hmm. When we label data, there'll be a set of intents. There'll be some entities that we try to extract. But even as they see those entities either not being there or being labeled so that the outcome is wrong, Mm -hmm. they still move forward. As in, no, I'll drive that car into a wall. And I'm putting this in airports <laughs> and nobody can see this. But their job is not to swing the car to the left. That is to drive it into the wall and say, I labeled it as we've agreed. And the machinery still took a decision which was not optimal. But the only way we can kind of learn from that is if I label it mm-hmm. per the guidelines. So that's the difference between going all McKinsey style on automating a workforce to do a job much faster and that of trying to train or create a corpus of data Mm -hmm. where you can have this autonomous agent kind of operate. Mm -hmm. So I'm hearing that as there's a difference between labeling and having a CSR jump in to kind of fix a situation and get it right. And labeling is kind of, you know, you're positioning it as the longer term approach, but certainly it's one that contributes more towards generating a, you know, a, a bigger, you know, better data set. Whereas having the CSR jump in and you know, provide the right answer when the AI gets stuck might not necessarily contribute to the long-term solution. Couldn't agree more. And it's not that there's anything wrong with that. As in, you can create a formidable business on sure. humans in the loop. As in, that exists everywhere in the world. Call sure. a taxi. And yeah. there's a human in that car, right? So right. that exists today all over the place. My point from very early on was just that I think you have to Make up your mind whether you want to be one or the other the day you start yeah. because they are in conflict. And it's very easy to fall in love with the perfect outcome because it hurts less on the way there. Because I've suddenly had emails in my inbox mm-hmm. that have disappointment included into them. That's the most polite way I can put it for where <laughs> Amy made a mistake she shouldn't have made. Uh-huh. And the funny thing about machine mistakes, and you know this obviously, is that Machine mistakes don't look like human mistakes. So if you email me and you and I have a dialogue back and forth and there's a little bit of ambiguity in the way you put it, you can empathize with my decision. I said, oh, I see where Danish came from on that decision. But machines make different type of mistakes for where it is much harder to empathize. I said, that (laughs) is just so (laughs) obvious. I said, why didn't you get that? Right. Because there's a difference between the machine and you trying to kind of resolve what's being said here. And that means little things for where tonight at 1 a.m. you send me an email saying, hey, Dennis, I got something super important. We should meet up tomorrow and talk it through. The machine might just really do that tomorrow, but that's not what you're trying to do. You want it today. You're just so excited that you stayed up late and then you want to meet Dennis in eight hours from now, right? And that seems like a silly machine mistake. I said, you saw the importance. Couldn't you feel the importance in that email? And and I wanted to meet with you. In eight hours. Yeah. So that is kind of the interesting dilemma that we're in. But we've been taking those punches to the face for three years and we're sticking to it. 
Yeah. And so I am imagining your response to this, but based on the, the previous conversation around human in the loop, but for that particular type of error and those like it, is the answer labeling more data or is the answer developing some kind of front end set of hum heuristics that can help guide the AI down the right path? So that's a really good question. So I think people see this as a single problem. But it's probably kind of a set of problems. And I think if you were to simplify it, perhaps, there's the initial natural language understanding challenge, which is not kind of a solved science. And the only hope we have is that we picked a space so narrow that we might be able to understand everything which is being talked about when we talk about meetings. Right. But even as you solve that, that is certainly a place for where many times what we just need is more data. As in, there's things in our little universe here that happen so rare that the data set is still so sparse. And I'll give you an example. So a new meeting intent, for the very definition that a meeting is about to happen, that happens in every single meeting that we set up. So that means we have a ton of new meeting intent data. As in, you can say pretty much what you want. Hey, Denise, let's do the hokey pokey come early next week. <laughs> we understand that being you wanting to set up a new meeting. But you're trying to change the pin code to the conference call. Happens yeah. one out of 10,000 meetings. So yeah. I do 100,000 meetings and I have 10 data points. As in that is so sparse. It's not about any type of model which I might put in place. As in there's just not enough data really to take any good decisions here. Yeah. So that is something for we can certainly see. We just need to keep churning through more meetings. Mm -hmm. And we can see that kind of the level of accuracy continues to increase. Mm -hmm. So that's the one challenge. Then... If you do understand what's being said, as in that NLU engine you put in place mm -hmm. is robust and backed by a very large data set, you need to have some sort of reasoning engine in place for where you email Amy at x.ai and say, hey, I'm going to be running five minutes late. If I understand it, that doesn't mean I know what to do with it. Do I do nothing? Do I do something? If I do something, what is that something? What does that look like? That is where, as you allude to, there's a lot of design where I can help take you down a dialogue path which is more likely to end up in a successful outcome versus another dialogue path for where it is less likely to end up in a successful outcome. And we can certainly see, and this sounds devious and it's not, that if we help direct people down one avenue, we're right. both going to end up slightly happier, certainly more likely to end up slightly happier. And then in the end, if you take some action in your reasoning engine, that is some sort of computational outcome, then you need some NLG engine that can take that computational outcome and turn it into language so we can communicate clearly to all the constituents. That is also a place where we found that we thought it was clear what we just communicated. But given that the conversational UI is somewhat of a new UI, perhaps not to you and I who started on the command line, but certainly to many people in the middle for where they grew up in the graphical user interface. They don't have some inner connection to the conversational <laughs> UI. And that have been just a long optimization path, trying to figure out exactly how to put it. And you describe that last step as NLG. To what yep. extent is it real kind of NLG versus picking from a list of predefined things? We don't think there's a decision tree of sorts for where if I just do every single branch and have enough templates in place, mm -hmm. I can find that template that matches that particular setting that I ended up on. Mm -hmm. So we've tried to create, and I'm certainly not saying that we solved it, but the only way that we can be so ambitious is again, we picked a single vertical meaning that you can talk all you want about Chelsea Football Club winning the premiership next year. We don't have any idea. But if you talk about meetings, we can generate pretty fluid responses that are created on the fly. And the reason that we need that is that even though meetings sound, sounds almost simple, they're just not. Because you talk about multiple times in multiple ways, well, multiple participants, some mandatory, some optional, some assistance, Sure. And not you don't to get it, even get into all the rescheduling and the moving locations. And, and, and all of that. And you don't follow the path that we set forth. And that means sometimes we need to talk about fewer things. Sometimes I need to talk about multiple things at the same time. Mm -hmm. So we assemble those on the fly and have been kind of forced to build this kind of design setting 
So if you want some sort of visual output, you know, you and me will go install Photoshop and four other tools and we'll end up with some palette of little sprites that we can use for that kind of output. Where do you design conversational UIs? As in, not in Word, but mm -hmm. where? Right? So uh, right now you're building your own thing to do you, it, right? We're building our own <laughs> thing. And the same actually goes for the fun of it here on the labeling end. Where do you label your data? As in, hopefully not in Excel. So you gotta label it somewhere else. So you build your own kind of labeling piece of software. So those NLG scripts and scripting that we've invented with some sort of amalgamation of raw text and JavaScripts and our own little version of JavaScript mm -hmm. is how we kind of generate these uh, responses. Mm, interesting. But even they can, given that they are programmatic, end up sometimes not sound obvious. As in, why does he say that? As in, that's not even a proper sentence. I know, I'm also sorry, but it's because we're <laughs> trying to generate it on the fly. So we actually don't know what it looks like until she starts talking. Mm. And are you English only currently or multiple languages? English only. Okay. Okay. We are, and you're, you're, but, you're kind of sighing <laughs> and sitting back in the chair like, so, no, that is a big problem, it sounds like. So we have really three dimensions for where we're going to go expand. <laughs> and the reason I do the kind of slight sigh, sorry, <laughs> because it was so visual, is that whenever we raised another $2 in capital, uh -huh. we immediately get the, hey, when are you going to do more languages? Yeah. We could talk about the challenge in that. Two, when are you going to do more communication channels? And we can talk about the challenge in that. Mm -hmm. We will most certainly do both of them. We want the agent to be multilingual, mm -hmm. not just so we can attack other markets, but so that we can better serve the guest. So we set up meetings in about 190 countries today, mm -hmm. but we really only have customers in English-speaking nations. Mm -hmm. But they meet up with people all over the world. So for me, up with somebody in Germany, I could actually remove some of the ambiguity if I spoke to him in his own language. Yeah. So we most certainly will do that. And then the last one is that we want to make those obvious integrations into things that revolve around the event itself. Mm -hmm. Say, whenever you meet up with somebody in Midtown, you use Uber. One, she set up the meeting. Two, she knows where it's at. Three, she knows where your office is at. Why do I have to kind of click for the Uber? You can just make it happen. Or even better, why do I have to spend an hour in Yelp trying to figure out where we're going to meet? Those little things <laughs> where, hey, you know I eat at Haru Sushi whenever I meet up with people. Just book the table. It's not rocket science, right? Right, right. So those are certainly the three dimensions. But today, it's all email, all English, very few integrations. Okay. And you mentioned some of the challenges on the language side. Is it all like doing it all over again. Certainly there are some economies of scale and you have to see the face that yeah. associates this question in particular. <laughs> There's not you, but certainly other people from the outside, if they haven't thought about it for more than a few minutes, immediately just lets on to, oh, so it's just about kind of translating your templates. First search, of all, search and replace, yeah, right? Yeah. Of course. <laughs> I didn't I read some article Can't you about, outsource that yeah, to, you know? So somewhere, right? <laughs> Google Translate is good. Pop files. Yeah. <laughs> so I think there's two parts to it. There's certainly the fact that we might have to train on a local data set. As in, the way you set up meetings in Northern Europe versus Southern Europe or the Caribbean or Asia might actually just be slightly different. It could just be that Northern Europe, we are super direct we are perhaps slightly more casual, and I'm saying that as an insult, if we go to Southern Europe. We might just have little cues in Asia that we don't have in the US. And if I don't pick up on that, I might not have the intelligent agent I had hoped for in a different language. So that certainly suggests we might have to train on a local data set. Mm. I'm imagining a country where you know, the level of politeness, maybe Japan might be an example of this, is so high that, you know, if someone says, okay, that means they don't really want that time. That's just their way of not, so not I'll, to offend the Japanese. We might even cut this whole segment out. <laughs> <laughs> now, so now I'll give you something where both you and I are involved. So it's only you and I we are insulting now. Yeah. So I'm Danish. I assume you're American. Yep. And here's the thing we don't do in Northern Europe. So you and me can set up a meeting for May 17th next year at my office, mm -hmm. and you'll never hear from me. Mm -hmm. 
I will just assume you turn up at my office and it's all good. Here's what most Americans do. Confirm. Triple confirm. <laughs> so you knew it already. Three weeks prior to the meeting. Hey, Dennis, just checking in. I'll see you in about three weeks. <laughs> the day before, Dennis, see you tomorrow at one o'clock. The first time I'll do the, yeah, I know. It's on my calendar. The third time I have, yeah, I fucking know. We talked about this like four times now. <laughs> and the funny thing is that we've actually had to engineer for that in our solution. Because as you double confirm, there's many things which you say in that that rhyme with a reschedule. So we need to be very good at picking up on the fact that all you're doing here is just giving me a thumbs up. One of the designs that we've done to kind of protect against that is that Amy have learned this skill as well, which is that she will reach out knowing that we set up the meeting a long time ago mm -hmm. and you are American. So prior to the meeting happening, she'll reach out and say, hey, just give me your thumbs up. The meeting's for tomorrow at one o'clock. If there's no changes, I'll assume you're both all good and set. Mm -hmm. She'll have a better language than that. So that is one of those interesting things where we and probably- so does Amy just do that for the American and assumes that the Northern European is good? So right now she does it for everybody. <laughs> and we haven't had any complaints for where, hey, don't be so uh, overly anal. Amy. See, they're just taking it, you know, and that's that. But I can certainly imagine. And that brings me to the second part of the language challenge outside of being able to train a new data set, which is what I alluded to here, is that there's probably some product design choices mm -hmm. that you need to make for the particular market that you're in. Example? Take our reminder logic. So. Mm -hmm. I see and Amy to set up a meeting between you and I, say for Friday. You are slightly tardy or busy. You're here today, right? Doing all sorts of things. Mm -hmm. How quick can Amy nudge you? Mm -hmm. So we can certainly see East Coast US, you can be reasonably aggressive. Mm -hmm. We can certainly also see that even just within the US, there's other places for where people are not as comfortable in her reasoning out as yeah, quick as she's doing. As in, she's a little bit too bossy for them. Yeah. And Certainly people in New York, sure, yeah. still let's do this. But there's certainly other places where that is not the case. Do you find at all that people, that people try to give Amy the kind of advice that they might give an actual assistant? Like, hey, Amy, you need to tone it down a little bit or that kind of thing? Or to what extent does Amy blur the lines between a virtual assistant, like, well, virtual assistant's overloaded, but <laughs> yeah. an AI and a, a human? That's a very interesting question. And I'm not sure you, me, or anybody really got the answer just yet. Mm -hmm. What I don't think you should do, and certainly not something which we're trying to do, is to play a game of daily touring tests for where you try <laughs> to fool people into believing that this is a human. Yeah. I'm finding it hard to figure out what you win on each one of those tests. Sure, you can have a little bit of a ha-ha moment and a little bit of social fun and, uh, and that's that. But really probably just make, your, make the job harder for yourself the next time. That is exactly <laughs> what is happening. So we try very hard to be upfront and honest about the fact that this is machinery, but do the job so well that you kind of forget or don't care. And I'll just give you one stat here that we did early on. So in... 11% of all the meetings which we do, at least one of the emails in that dialogue will have one intent only, mm -hmm. gratitude. As in somebody emailed Amy back saying, thank you, mm -hmm. or I appreciate you setting this up for Friday. Mm -hmm. So sorry for not getting back to you earlier. <laughs> Even people like me, I bloody work there, will start out my kind of handovers with, Amy, would you be so kind? <laughs> and it's not that I don't know what's going on here. But that is interesting, and we're still so early that there's probably going to be a half decade before we fumble a little bit until we figure out what is the right design for this new setting where we have kind of mixed agents, some human, mm -hmm. some machine. Have you ever thought about whether in that particular example you're doing that for Amy or for the human that's on the other side of the email? So there's some research that suggests in any master-slave relationship, if the master is acting in an aggressively demeaning way towards the slave, it's actually not the slave who's losing, it's the master. And there's plenty of traditional research on that for where the more rude you turn over time, the sadder things really become for you. Mm -hmm. And that's also why we have these early suggestions for where you should probably be kind to the 
Alexis and the series and the Cortanas of the world, mm -hmm. especially if you have kids around the house, because you are in one way certainly asking a question, but you're also teaching some other human being about how to behave in the world. Mm -hmm. And there's certainly a thing missing right now for where they will not learn it otherwise if they don't learn it from you, because there's no real penalties built into these systems yet, which I think we need to have. Mm -hmm. Penalties for where... Like Amy talking back? I don't think that's the right design, but yes. <laughs> so I don't know who you think you're talking to, Buster, but I'm not scheduling anything for you if you talk to me like that. <laughs> well, that could get the I, point across. <laughs> that would get the point across. I think if you uh, walked into the uh, team of AI interaction designers we have, they would kind of say, yeah, I hear you. Let's, Let's uh, massage that a little bit and kind of see what we can do here. But my point is certainly one which aligns with what you said here for where, say, we pick a slightly more refined example for where you are really a super kind person, but you kind of late all the time. Mm -hmm. You're a little bit tardy. Still nice though. That means as Amy is about to suggest you and me meeting up tomorrow, if she knows that you're probably not going to really be there for the 8 a.m., mm -hmm. like a third of the meetings you do, you reschedule. It's just who you are. Nice, but tardy. Perhaps she should really just start out by suggesting, how about we meet up at 1? <laughs> Worst case, then he can just continue to work his inbox. He didn't have to kind of get up early and be at the office for only to kind of sit there alone because you didn't get there. Mm -hmm. And that is us taking into consideration that people are different here. And what I want is, even if you kind of perhaps even turn into an asshole, perhaps the response speed just slows down. As in, she's super speedy, you know, machine speedy, right? But perhaps we'll put this on the cooler a little bit. I'll respond to you in half an hour. And I'm not sure what those designs look like, but I actually do think they eventually will have to emerge in these systems. Hmm. Interesting, interesting. Before we wrap up, I want to go back to a comment that you made earlier about just about the different machinery, the different tools that you've had to build on your own. I've talked to several companies in the conversational space over the past few days, and everyone's building the same things. Right. Everyone has, you know, they started off, they tried wit.ai, api.ai, you know, the kind of the black box nature of those platforms didn't work out for them. You know, you're saying similar things, you know, the platform itself, plus all of the tooling that goes around, you know, labeling annotation. Is this all stuff that you think that everyone is doomed to reinvent for themselves or, you know, or is it the nature of the problem says that? you know, folks will want to create these things over and over? Or do you think the problem will eventually lend itself to a more of a platform type of an approach? It depends on how loaded the word platform is. <laughs> I certainly believe that the tooling will disappear as a task for the individual companies. Mm -hmm. That doesn't ring true to me. And I've been around long enough to see how the first mover were forced to make all sorts of choices for where they would go and implement things for where had there been a tool out there, I wouldn't have implemented that. But there was no tool out there. Mm -hmm. So that goes from any type of labeling or even any kind of NLG type design you would have to do. I expect that type of tooling to arrive. I'm actually even surprised that more people are not trying to attack the kind of AI space from that angle. Yeah. And I haven't really seen anybody do anything but just do it for themselves. So for where, right. hell, we might even want to one day spin that out and say, hey, here's a tool for where somebody else might be able to take advantage of that. Mm -hmm. And go back, say, 30 years, pretty much any Fortune 2000 would pretty much implement their own ERP system. Mm -hmm. If you did that, in 2017, you would be crazy. You would install you know, some Oracle, PeopleSoft, whatever type ERP, and hopefully be happy with that. So tooling, I agree, should and will be commercialized. Now, on the generalized ability to kind of make predictions, I think there's a difference between whether you're being in a high accuracy or low accuracy space. Higher accuracy meaning that your product can't exist without a very high degree of accuracy in its predictions. Mm -hmm. So a self-driving car 
cannot live with a footnote that suggests for every 1,000 miles we hit a pedestrian. Even though that is a fantastic piece of software, it just can't exist in market. But there's certainly plenty of software for where, hey, I pick up 80% of the faces in all of the photos that you upload. Nice. As in, that's not too shabby. As in, that's really just you helping me out for where I don't need to kind of tag those faces in most of the images which I upload. That's good. And for that, you should probably just go use Clarify. And that becomes, I think, a good platform play. But I think right now, if you cannot live with a kind of degree of error, you probably have to figure out how do I then go engineer my own high accuracy backdrop. And the only way you can beat those platforms is by being super focused on some vertical way. I'm just the guy who scheduled meetings, right? As in, yeah. <laughs> right. we've optimized everything for that particular right. use case. And it's not that we're necessarily smarter than the next guy, it's just hyper-focused. So yes, I do think that will arrive. What I don't think will arrive is that you want to build something on Facebook Messenger, the tools which they provide will be all you need. Sure, for some nifty few basic things, but not for anything serious. Okay, great. Well, I really enjoy this conversation. Dennis, thanks so much for joining us. This was fun. We should do it again. Awesome. Thank you. Cheers. Cheers. All right, everyone. That's our show for today. Thanks so much for listening and for your continued feedback and support. For more information on Dennis, x.ai, or any of the topics covered in this episode, head on over to twimlai.com slash talk slash 67. We hope you've enjoyed our NYU Future Labs AI Summit series. If you need to catch up on any of the episodes, visit twimlai.com slash AI Nexus Lab 2. Of course, you can send along your feedback or questions via Twitter to at TwimmelAI or at Sam Charrington or leave a comment or write on the show notes or series pages. Thanks again to Future Labs for their sponsorship of this series. For more information on the program, visit futurelabs.nyc. And of course, thank you once again for listening and catch you next time.